So welcome to the webinar, uh, The Magic of Growing Microgreens. My name is Lori George, and I am a small farms local foods educator out of the Mount Vernon area in Illinois. Uh, I also have James Thury. James, would you like to say hi? Hi, everyone. My name is James Thury. I'm an extension educator just like Rolly George, and we are both small farms and local foods educators. And Thank you everyone for coming. And you're located in Kankakee, is that correct? Kankakee, Will and Count, and uh, uh, Kankakee, Will and Grundy counties. These are Kola counties around Cook County area of Chicago. So they're kind of close to that. Yep. Yes. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So James, if you want to take it off. Okay, go on to the next slide. So let's start by defining what microgreens are, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with microgreens. And microgreens are young and tender and edible greens that are produced by sprouting the seeds of a variety of vegetable species and herbaceous plants. And as we shall see, even some cereals can also be part of this uh, group. And we can also include aromatic herbs and wild edible species. And the big deal with microgreens is they are loaded with vitamins, minerals, and proteins. They truly are a superfood used to boost, boost color, enhance flavor, and add texture to any dish while delivering a nutritional boost as well. Indeed, when I teach about lawns, I always tell people who are throwing away the, the blades of grass that they cut, which are the tips of the grass, that's what we mow. You're throwing away the best part of the grass, which should be food for the grass. That's always the loaded part of uh, the plant when it comes to nutrition. Same thing with these microgreens. But let's go on to the next slide. Why do we want to grow microgreens then? They're fun and easy to grow. Even children, you can involve your children or any kids or youth. Schools, you can involve uh, younger people in this because it's a very easy to grow, easy plant to grow. And then beyond that, they are quick to grow. You harvest in 10 to 14 days. Later on, I'll show you an example of something I grew 10 days ago is ready to eat. And they require small spaces. So if you are an urbanite, if you are living in a, an apartment and all you have is a balcony or a windowsill, you can grow these microgreens. And then um, they have very simple requirements in terms of equipment and we'll be seeing that in a little bit later. They are suitable for climates. You can grow them anywhere in the world. And then you can grow them year round, as long as you have suitable facilities, and we'll talk about that as well. And then the minimal cost. Well, if you, can, you actually you can keep the costs really low, and we'll talk about that as well. And require very little time and effort. As long as you have the sound management, then they will just do it, do, do right. So you have an incredible number of plants that are in a very tiny area. And that gives you a high yield to space ratio. And finally, they are highly edible. They're highly chewable. They are digestible because they are tender. They have not developed any fibrous tissue or lignins or so forth, the things that are difficult to digest. And being very nutritious, they are also a very versatile superfood, which is nutrient dense, and you can use it in a variety of ways. And then as we shall also see later, you have fantastic value. If you're getting a dollar an ounce on the minimum, I mean, that's usually the low end of the cost a dollar an ounce. An ounce is not a whole lot of it, but if you can get that, it's high value crop. Next. 
So I included this slide here to show you that microgreens have meganutrients, just to emphasize the point. In a research study done in 2012, microgreens were found to contain considerably higher concentrations of vitamins and carotenoids compared to the mature, to their mature relatives or uh, parts of the plant. And the, the one example he given here on the left hand side is that if you buy your one pound and four ounces of broccoli, you could as well have just found yourself an ounce of broccoli sprouts. They say sprouts there. It could very well have been microgreens. Same thing. They are nutrient dense. That's what that indicates. Look at the red cabbage over there. Vitamin E in microgreens is 40 times over compared to uh, the, the grown up red cabbage and so forth. I mean, it's anywhere from four to 40 times with various crops. Next. <laughs> so again, people kind of mix up microgreens and sprouts and we are going to be emphasizing this over and over again. So if you hear this again, bear with us. But microgreens generally are grown in some sort of a medium. You know what that? That medium could be soil. It could be soil less as well. And we'll talk about that later as well. Then you need that container to hold the medium, of course. You eat both the leaves and the stems in microgreens. That would be the shoot. Anything above the soil line would be what we eat. And then they take a little bit longer, the microgreens, to grow compared to sprouts. Sprouts, you see them quite a bit in, uh, in if you go to Jimmy John's, they have this sandwich, they always put sprouts in. And those don't, don't uh, they're not, they don't allow them to grow longer than a week. They are ready to be eaten at that point in time. Microgreens are packed with flavor and they're used as garnishes and they are generally more flavorful compared to sprouts, which have mild flavor and they are used for their textural appeal. They're crunchy. And later on, I'll be talking about radishes, which are my favorite. Okay. Next slide. Okay, let's talk a little bit about equipment. So you're gonna be a small grower. You, if you are a commercial grower, um, you'll probably have more equipment, more trays, more light, more seeds. But generally for a homeowner, it's very easy, very simple to get set, set up. So let's talk first about the trays and the lids. So shallow trays, they want something that's gonna be shallow. You don't need something that's deep. Black plastic works well. Uh, if you have a wooden container, that will work. The only problem with a wooden container is if you get disease in the root system of your plants, it will be very hard to get that disease pathogens out of the wood without really cleaning and sanitizing it between each use. So wood can work, but there's some potential concerns with that. Uh, old baking containers with holes, uh, something like a small, uh, maybe a pan that's maybe a half inch thick, half inch high, something like that. But you want something that's gonna have holes. It's gonna be shallow, it's gonna be lightweight, and it should be movable. A lot of those things that you see on that slide there, as far as those plastic containers on the right, that you generally get the uh, strawberries or blueberries in when you buy them at the grocery stores. Uh, anything that you can buy at a retail store that has the tray plus the plastic lid covers work really well, as well as clay pots. Uh, so you want to be able to use wide shallow clay pots if possible. The clay will dry out quicker than plastic, so keep that in mind depending on which one you want to use. You want to use, uh, choose the wide containers over the tall containers. The wide containers are going to maximize the surface area and minimize any unnecessary extra soil usage. 
Drainage is important, so no drainage will result in stunted growth, rot, and mold in your microgreens, and we'll see that a little bit later. On the lids, you want to be able to create some sort of a greenhouse effect, which keeps the moisture and the temperature constant, as opposed to leaving the seeds open to the environment. Make sure the lid fits onto your container, um, or is, if you have a container that you want to use that doesn't have a lid, make sure you have something that can be placed fully over the germination container to make sure it keeps those moistures in. If using a pot, you can place the pot in a plastic bag and seal or cover it with a plastic sheet or piece of glass, whichever works. But using these techniques will help maintain a good environment for the plant. Uh, unfortunately, when you keep a container like that, that's moist, has a lot of moisture in it, and you keep it covered for long periods of time, it can invite disease concerns. And we'll talk about some of these a little bit later. Once you have them covered, make sure you keep them out of the direct sun. So store it in the shade. They don't need sunlight at this point until they start germinating and producing their uh, cotyledons or their first uh, leaves. So you can store it in the shade. Um, the lids again, clear black. Do your research. Uh, what will be needed in order for your seeds to germinate? So each seed or each variety is gonna be a little bit different. If the seeds need darkness, flip a black tray over the top of the seeded flat or place a board over it. Other things you may see on the internet when you start doing your research are using paper towels or cloth towels to cover your trays. Uh, these can be used. The cloth towels should be washed and, and cleaned and sanitized uh, after every use so you don't have the potential of uh, having those pathogens uh, be present on a new crop. The paper towels themselves, you're going to go ahead, you'll see pictures later, but you'll see the, the paper towels laid on the soil and then you miss the paper towels and then you put those plastic covers on top of that. So those are going to work. Uh, the soil and felt pads, which you're going to see, are going to be things like, uh, well, Actually, the soil and felt pads, the plants draw all of the nutrients from the soil and the water. And since the crop will be growing closely packed together, the quality of the soil is going to be important. You need to choose a mix that has some sort of organic matter, if possible, that's incorporated into it, such as compost or earthworm castings or kelp or something like that. Uh, that will help benefit the growth and the health of the plants, especially if you're looking to grow microgreens as a commercial endeavor. Uh, if using uh, felt pads that you see on the right can be used, but they can be expensive. Uh, but if you're using them, put water into the tray uh, that does not have holes on it, put the pad in there to wet it, flip it over and wet the other side. And then what you're gonna do is sprinkle the seeds on top and then mist it. Uh, you can take a second tray, uh, spray the inside of the second tray and then invert it over your seeded tray and that will help keep the moisture in. If you don't have a second tray, use a cloth towel or uh, unbleached paper towels if you have those. Remember, if you're using paper towels, keep it moist until the towels start to rise above the soil about an inch. So as the cotyledons, as these seedlings start to grow, the paper towel will start to rise off the seed bed itself. Um, so about an inch, you can go ahead and look at under the paper towels and see what your germination is on that. But once the cotyledons uh, leaves emerge or the first type of leaves emerge, then remove the lids and then place them in light and then you probably go ahead and uh, miss them twice a day. This is an example of University of Florida that they had between soil and the pads that you just saw. Uh, so they had, I wanted to show you this because you can really see a difference after the same amount of growth time between the soil and those that are grown on the pads themselves. Remember those pads can be a little bit more expensive, um, but you do have some sort of difference and you can really see the growth difference on those. James? Growing media. Okay, let's look at some of the thoughts that go with growing media. What kind of medium? should one use? And there are a few of you that ask questions related to uh, choice of media. And yes, like I said earlier, you can use uh, 
soil or soil less media. I mean, peat and coconut coal, all those are soil less media and can be used. And the reason is because um, the seed itself has lots of food that is stored and that, can, and that is usually used for up to two weeks. I have a picture of a, of a seed, a bean seed, top right hand corner there, which is just starting to germinate and you can see the leaf starting to form and pretty soon the radical will be forming the root that will anchor this uh, new plant. But you'd also see the cotyledon or the, the, the part labeled cotyledon will be the endosperm. And that endosperm can feed that little micro plant for anything up to two weeks. So really you don't need medium that is got lots of nutrients in it. You just saw a previous slide there where soil and pads were compared. The soil appears to give the plants better anchorage, that's one, but of course, these, these new seedlings will also acquire a little bit of nutrient, nutrients from that soil, which has, it is a potting mix. If it's a potting mix, then it will have some food in it. So there's some advantage there. And we'll see, we'll talk a little bit later also about what you can save by make, making your own soil. If you can come up with your own soil mix, you will be saving yourself quite a bit of money. And as you see there, it could be soil, the media could cost anywhere between $1 and 50 cents up to $4 per 10, 20 tray. And the 10, 20 tray is the picture you see down below there, which I think is 10 inches by 20 inches wide. That's why they call it 10, 20. That's, that's what I'll be calling it from now onwards. So, of course, especially if you're a commercial grower, you always want to go for highest quality media at the lowest price. So if you can make your own better, even better. What I grew myself the last 10 days was done in potting mix. Of course, there's an expense there, but as a homeowner, maybe I can just get away with that. Okay. So um, then we've got to remember that some of these microgreens, we eat them at their cotyledon leaves, once those are formed. Cotyledon leaves are the false leaves. The, the leaves that come after the cotyledons open are the first true pair of leaves. With the other microgreens, we want to wait till the first true pair of leaves appear. So again, there is a difference. If you're doing things hydroponically, and we'll talk about that in a second, you may also not need any post-planting post fertilization just because, like I said, this seed here has the endosperm, which is full of nutrients that can be used by the micro plant, the micro uh, green. And there is advice that if you use similar fertilizers like fish emulsion, uh, it's desirable because some people have sensory issues. Maybe the smell isn't too good for them. And a lot of people advocate that we can reuse the media if you are using. So if if you have like potting mix, and you have all these uh, roots that have been left behind you can just mix that with new potting mix and reuse. But as we shall see later, because of concerns with potential disease spread, maybe it's just better to throw that away or recompost it. And once it's recomposted, use it after that, rather than using it immediately thereafter. Next. Okay. Some of the other equipment that you're going to need, uh, let's talk about watering. So if you're growing your microgreens outside, you can use a food grade hose and potable water. 
Uh, the sprayer should be gentle enough to water the tray or the trays, but not blow the seeds out of the tray by the force of the water coming out of the hose. So you want to be able to get some sort of a uh, handle or a sprayer that has a mist uh, portion or being able to gently mist. Um, and then during the germination phase, once the cotyledons and the seedlings have started to form and the germination phase is, is, has progressed, then you can change to a medium spray. Um, a watering can will work uh, as well as uh, with the late seedling stage as well. Overhead watering can cause disease concerns. So if you are going to overhead water your plants, make sure you have good air circulation so the disease does not form. Another method of watering would be to water from below. Put the growing trays in a container that doesn't have holes, put water in there, put enough water in so the tray can wick up the water into the seedling root system. This will eliminate the potential of getting the cotyledons wet, which uh, where the disease is going to progress. Another concern with water is that municipal water sources generally have chlorine in it, uh, which plants uh, negatively react to, depending on the species. So try and use some sort of filter water or rainwater. When we talk about the pH of the plant, I mean the pH of the uh, soil and the water itself, pH is going to be important to keep an eye on. It tells you how acidic uh, or how alkaline the soil is. Acidic, think something like vinegar or lemon juice. And when I say alkaline, think something like ammonia. Um, the range for most of the soil uh, pH is from 0 to 14 with 7 being in the middle. So with the uh, Plants, most plants are grown outside in the fields, have a pH sweet range between 6.3 and 7.4, depending on the plant variety. And that's in between those two red lines. And you notice with those boxes, you have more of those nutrients available to you because it's a wider box in those areas, as opposed to the left-hand side or the right-hand side, where they tend to dis uh, decrease as the pH goes up and down. With microgreens, since the production cycle is only about two to three weeks, it's going to be important to keep track of your water pH. And this will determine how well your microgreens are able to access the nutrients in the soil. If it's too low or too high, then the nutrients will not be available to your seedlings, which can show up with yellowing cotyledons, poor growth, or rot. Keeping the pH of the water at the uh, requirement for your specific crop is going to be about generally 6 to 6.5. So generally where that blue line is at on the screen. You'll need to do your research to determine what that is. There are a lot of good books and internet has a lot of information on this. So take a few moments to get a good handle in this area. There are also many options as to how to raise and lower your pH, one of which is buying products at your local retail store and the products are like pH up or pH down. And these are generally found in the aquatic section where they sell the fish, fish tanks, things like that. Other products for lowering the pH to make it more acidic can be incorporating a little bit of lemon juice. Or to raise the pH, you can use a little bit of baking soda or powdered lime will work as well. Just make sure if you're going to use a powdered uh, product that it's completely dissolved before you test for your pH. So heat mats or what they call propagation mats are also used. A lot of commercial growers use this, but if you're growing your microgreens in a cool environment, having a heat mat underneath the root system is going to be beneficial. Uh, this generally is used to maintain a higher temperature in the soil environment to help promote germination. They are generally not needed unless you are trying to germinate in colder environments, like I mentioned before, or during the winter months. Temperatures of 65 to 75 degrees will promote the rooting, but once your rooting has occurred, then you need to remove the heat because if the, the heat stays on to the root system as the plants start to grow, then it will uh, prevent root elongation. 
Uh, other things that you'll need are your harvesting tools and harvesting equipment. So a good pair of sharp scissors or a sharp knife will be able to work well to cut those microgreens cleanly. Make sure you treat your harvested microgreens like you would any delicate salad green. Keep it in the fridge. You can keep it up for about a week if it's stored properly. If you have potential of drying out during this time, can place a damp paper towel in the plastic bag along with the microgreens and then put it in the fridge. The bag itself should remain open, uh, but the cool temperatures will help reduce any type of uh, decomposition that's gonna occur. The damp paper towel will maintain the high humidity around the cuttings. Just be careful that if it's too wet, it will promote growth of fungus and molds within the bag itself. All right, let's talk a little bit about light sources and their uses. So lights growing outside, you can uh, keep the seeds and the germination trays in a dark location until germination occurs and then move it out into the sunlight. If you're growing inside, the type of lighting system you're gonna choose is, is gonna depend on how many trays you are going to grow and what your budget is. Most common lighting systems is with fluorescent lights like the shop light systems. Light systems should be on for about four to nine hours. Fluorescent lights are better for the plants than incandescent bulbs. If you remember those incandescent bulbs, those are the old light bulbs that are being phased out. And so the fluorescent lights that you see now are gonna be cooler and they can have a better color range for the plants than incandescent bulbs. And those examples in the upper right hand corner of the screen are just some indications of the uh, type of bulbs that are available for uh, growers. But when you're choosing your fluorescent lights, there are many to choose from. The color temperature is a way to describe the light appearance provided by a light bulb. So it's measured in degrees of Kelvin. And for most light systems, growers are going to look for light temperatures of at least 4,000 K, but preferably to up to 5,000 or 6,500 K. The higher the number, the closer it is to sunlight or natural light. So what I have here is just a picture of uh, one of the light bulbs. And so when you look in the light bulb itself, it's gonna tell you specifically, it's a 14 watt bulb with 3000 K. So as the uh, Kelvin goes up, like the five or the 6400, uh, the 6400 K is gonna be 125 watts. The, or 55 watts. So it's going to change and it will go up, the wattage will go up as the Kelvins go up. But you can see how it's used here in this commercial uh, micropropagation uh, business here where they have those sets up uh, all on the counters, uh, two rows with those shop light systems set up on that, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. You can also use LED lights. Now, these LED lights, um, work by having the current pass through a conducting material. And these tend to cast light uh, when electricity is supplied and it's gonna cast different colored lights. This technology uh, doesn't rely on heat to produce the light and has greater efficiency, energy efficiency than incandescent bulbs. Uh, these LEDs have low energy usage. There's low heat given off just like the fluorescence. So the fluorescence can stay anywhere from two to four inches above the plants. These LEDs can uh, be anywhere from 10 to 16 inches from the plants. They last a, lo a long time. Uh, if you have an existing shop light system, these lights are available to fit, it, fit into the ballasts, but it, you may need to modify your, your ballast system a little bit. So make sure you do a little bit of research on that. The nice thing about this is that these LED lights generally are no wiring is going to be required. So it makes it easy just to go ahead and buy it and put it up. And the nice thing about the LEDs is that there's no glass to break. If the fluorescent bulbs break, those are going to uh, have glass all over the place. And so you may have a problem. So these LEDs are really nice. Sourcing your seeds or getting your seeds. So Make sure you use quality seeds. Factors that go into these quality seeds, if you're saving seeds from year to year, are going to be storage conditions, the handling, how they were handled, the age, and the source of the seed itself. 
Having quality seeds with a high germination rate will ensure that you have a higher yield than if you're only using a lower one. <clears throat> high germination rate of about 95%. It's gonna be a lot better than one that has a 50% germination rate. You don't need to use just the packets of seeds that are specifically labeled for microgreens. Seed packets from the store can be used to grow microgreens, although there are several varieties that do better than others. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Vegetable and herb plants are the most common seeds grown as microgreens. There are several companies that sell microgreen mixes. And these mixes are especially good for beginners because they're mixed so they know when they're gonna be coming up all at the same time. The seed packets themselves are going to have some information. Um, and so one of the things with these seed packets and the sourcing of the seeds is to make sure that when you buy these seeds, you wanna buy them untreated. Now the picture on the right is going to show you some seeds. The corn on the top is natural seeds. The corn on the bottom that are pink has some sort of fungicide on them. So, and the one on the left where you see those uh, cucumber seeds, uh, they're treated blue. So again, there's some sort of a chemical on those seeds. But if you're doing microgreens, uh, you need to have untreated seeds if at all possible. So on the uh, coats themselves. So you want to be able to look at the germination rates. All the seed packets should have a germination rate on there. Um, the other thing is that if you have a lower germination rate on your seeds, not all the seeds are going to germinate at the same time. So you may plant a tray of seeds, but with a 50 or 60, 70 percent germination, you may have some that germinate early, you may have some that germinate later. So trying to get a really good batch of seeds with high germination rate is gonna be important. So uh, again, if you were going to do it commercially, that's gonna be a big thing, but you know, if you're kind of doing it for yourself, or you're just beginning, you know, just test it out and see what you have. So all of this generally boils down to the seed quality in making sure that you have a, a good germination rate on those seeds. So let's talk about seeding rates. The density of seeding is going to vary depending on the seeds that you're planting. Generally 10 to 12 seeds per square inch for the smaller seeds or 6 to 8 seeds for the larger seeds uh, depending on how you want it to go. It, there's no set uh, blueprint for this. It all depends on what you are looking for. You can broadcast the seeds or you can plant them in row. It doesn't matter. Most people broadcast. Once the seeds are on the soil, then you're going to press them into the medium with your hand to make sure that there is good contact between the seed and the medium itself. You need that contact in order for them to germinate. Once you've done this, then you're going to mist them and then you're going to cover them with the clear, clear lids or the board or the towels or the paper towels. Okay, keep them in the dark for the first few days. When the seeds start to germinate, you'll notice that the paper towel will become elevated, as I mentioned before. Uh, if you take the paper towel off too soon, some of the seedlings or seeds will be attached to the paper towel. And if that happens, then it's not quite ready to remove that towel. Put the towel back down, make sure that you still have good contact with the soil, um, and then wait a couple of days and try again. The thing is, is that you want those seedlings to be able to root into the soil. And because they're attached to the paper towel, that means that the rooting has not done, has not completed properly. James? Thank you. Um, that's an, one of the questions that a few of you asked was, what are the best seeds to plant for microgreens? And of course, the answer is it depends. It all depends on your taste and what you want to grow. If you are lazy like me, go with something like radish, which requires very little effort. That's what I like best. And I like the taste as well. So it all depends. But from this list, you can see that the choice of microgreens to grow is diverse across several families. And some of the examples I have. The Brassicaceae, which is the broccoli family, includes broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, radish, arugula, and watercress. The Asteraceae 
family, or which is the sunflower family, have sunflower, radicchio, chicory, and lettuce. The asteri well, that's the asterisk is the sunflower family. The apiaceae, which is the carrot family, has carrots, dill, fennel, and celery. The amarilli desie, and you don't need to know these from uh, this uh, biological names here. The onion family has onion itself, leek, and garlic. Can also be grown as microgreens. The amaranthaceae includes, it has the amaranth family, which includes amaranth seed, quinoa, Swiss chard, beet, and spinach. The cucabitaceae, which you can tell is the cucabit family, has cucumber, squash, melon, and then we have the grasses, the graminaceae, which includes the cereus, rice, oats, wheat, corn, barley, and others that we, we haven't mentioned here that, that uh, can be grown. Legumes, we didn't even talk about the beans, the bean family. Quite a number of beans can be grown for microgreens. Lentils, chickpeas, and it all depends on the individual. If you have the time to wait for three weeks as opposed to one week or 10 days, uh, if, the, if the taste is too sour or bitter for one and not the other, go for it. If you, have, if you want neutral taste, as opposed to spicy, yeah, like spicy, then go for whatever. It's all, it all depends on you. And if you're a commercial grower, maybe you've been asked to grow marigold. And as we shall see later on, marigold seed is pretty expensive. So you'll have to charge very expensively too. If your client is okay with that, why just go for it? Next slide. So microgreen seeds are same as the larger version, but you need a lot of seed. I know uh, Laurie just said you could actually go to the stores and buy the seed packets, but for the kind of densities we grow, and if you're going to continually grow throughout the year, then don't just buy these small few gram seed packets. Go ahead and go to a seed shop ensure that what you're buying is good for consumption as microgreens. We just saw that some seeds get treated with pesticides to protect them against fungi and insects. So make sure that they are labeled for microgreen production. And then one of you in the audience was frustrated when they tried to grow a seed mix for microgreens because there was lack of uniformity in growth. Yeah, that would be frustrating. Now, was this seed meant for you to cook or actually grow for microgreens? Make sure that you're buying the right seed for the right uh, purpose. So I'm not saying you made a mistake that it was for cooking and you did that, but uh, these mixes are available and if you go with a reputable seed supplier, they'll have done their research to know which seeds germinate at about the same rate before mixing them up like that. And then with a reputable company, you will get clean seed, clean as in being pathogen free. There are so many seed borne pathogens out there that could attach on seeds and you grow them and your seedlings start to fall over. That's not are desirable. And this is where organic seed is therefore greater than most other seeds because chemicals are really avoided. So get the information on the seed packet, whether this is consumable directly or not directly. And um, I would urge you to buy those that are labeled for microgreen use. Seeds, when they are allowed to pre-soak, especially the larger seed, it helps in uh, hastening the growth of the particular crop that you're growing. 
when you pre-soak, what happens is the seeds imbibe water, that means absorbing water, and that breaks the dormancy. Dormancy is the quiescence in the seeds. Seeds are not dead. They're just waiting for water or for that germination signal or stimulation. Mostly it's usually water. And that starts a cascade of biochemical events which lead to germination. So with the larger seeds like the beans and peas, if you, if you pre-soak them, and I would say overnight, before you go to bed, let them soak for six to eight hours if you're planning to do them, to plant them the following morning. So um, that helps. Can you sanitize my, microgreen seed? Yes, you can. If, you are, if you've been keeping your own seed and you think maybe you have had contamination with some microbial organisms, you can take four tablespoons of teaspoons of, of white vinegar and four teaspoons of food grade hydrogen peroxide in one quart of water, soak for 10 minutes. Then if they're the larger seeds, then soak them again in water for the six to eight hours. If you don't wanna make your own uh, disinfectant, buy something like Tsunami, it's, it's indicated on this slide. Tsunami is a mix of hydrogen peroxide and acetic acid. That's why it's called peroxyacetic acid. And it will do the same job of disinfecting your seed. It's organic. It's a, it's a OMRI, Organic Materials Research Institute, has labeled it as organic, so it's usable on those consumable seeds. Next. So again, we go to, again, this is just a slide I added there six suggested picks on the right hand side. My favorite is still radish, I say it again. And there are several radish varieties, by the way, there is the daikon radish and other types of radishes. As an individual, just experiment with ones that you find and pick on your best. And like I said, I like their spicy flavor. Now, I should point out that different microgreens have different benefits. They had some are more, you know, endowed with beta carotenes. Others have more vitamin C or vitamin A or folic acid or other minerals like manganese. So if you have a few, a few mixes of different types of microgreens, they will supplement each other and give you even more nutrient uh, rich food. And then, as you can see also from the right hand side, even with all the advantages, there's always the other side of the coin. Most microgreens need to be eaten as almost as soon as they are harvested. And we'll talk about storage later, although it's been mentioned that if you're going to store them, you can place them in a bag, place them in the fridge, and they store for one week or a few days, and a few days more, or a few days over one week. So microgreens, just like sprouts, need to be harvested in a timely manner. You let them go too long and then you're losing the nutrient value and they become leggy and so forth. Even better suggestions to give you an indication of ease of growing, maybe also earliness, is given on the left-hand side of this slide. And radish, as you can see, is one of the fast and easy ones. And in addition to its flavor, it's, it's, a, great, it's a great one to grow. It's just quite fast. And your choice all depends on you, I said. And if you're commercial, what are your clients asking you to grow for them and so forth. For instance, even though peas have been indicated there to be more challenging and uh, supposedly harder to grow, if you grow them successfully, by the time you are ready to harvest them to eat, you get a lot more biomass that is too chewy and flavorful. Remember that I said when you wait too long, 
you're starting to develop uh, lignins and pectins and fibers that may not be digestible, but the peas still retain their goodness even when they are a little bit bigger. You get more biomass. Next slide. So growing microgreens is, and this is a personal bias, dead easy. For me, it's a dead easy thing to do. All things considered equal. And that is, that is if your seed is viable, germination is pretty good. You don't have disease, you have the proper environment and you have the proper management. You're not underwatering or overwatering and all those bad things. All things held equal, they are very easy to grow. The roots of microgreens don't go that deep. And that's why you are not wasting your good soil or potting mix like I used to more than 1.5 inches. You're just using a little bit. And when you sow, like Claudia said, sow thickly and evenly, then give water. And most often the recommendation is you mist. And sub, sub, subsequently, if you have holes in the bottom of uh, your container, you can just put water in the secondary container so that water can go up by capillary reaction to the plants. And Rory also showed how you harvest. Uh, commercial growers like to use a very sharp knife so that it goes clean through the seedlings when you hold them. And two inches most often, some of them you wait till they're three inches, okay? And like I said then, your nutrient loss is low because one, you're not cooking your micro, your micro greens. And secondly, you eat them quickly. Remember that when you harvest any produce that you harvest, it is still undergoing metabolism. And metabolism means it's using some of its stored energy or nutrients. And so the longer you wait, the more that metabolism takes place and you're losing on the quality of your nutrients. So um, I, when it comes to watering them myself, I have, maybe I, I'm lazy again, but I just water them from the top and I watch that I'm not over watering them, okay? Um, so let's go to, uh, before we go to the next slide, I wrote there that where well, somebody also said, asked if hydroponics can be used. And yes, it can be done. Except now if you start growing hydroponically, you're probably getting more of sprouts than microgreens as shown in that picture over there. Lots of roots, they're not in any medium, they're just in water. And if you don't let them grow too big as to become unchewable, undigestible, you can eat the whole thing and that's what sprouts are, you know, we eat everything. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Again, there was a question about growing microgreens outdoors, and that is possible, no question about it. The lady gardener you see there is growing hers in summertime outside, but of, obviously these are not microgreens. So what is the deal with microgreens here? She densely planted whatever she has planted in those three uh, box uh, beds there, thickly in rows. And then what she did was when it came to time for thinning, she started pulling out everything that was, that she wanted to remove, to thin out. And those were her microgreens. So, she is going to let everything else grow to maturity, but she did eat quite a bit of what she planted in the beginning. So that's one way of doing it. The other one is, next slide. Uh, if you grow them outdoors, just like you grow them indoors, like about this time and which, one, which is what I did with mine, which I'm going to show you in a, sh in a short while, make observations that you are not uh, exposing them to too much sunlight. Do it in the shade, okay? 
if that's if you're doing it in a container that you can move around. So if you're going to plant in the ground, maybe you have a raised bed, watch out for other challenges like disease, because there you, have, you have a lot of soil borne disease, uh, disease pathogens in the ground. So watch out, do not overwater, see when you, when you get the first signs of disease, do something about it as well. There's also slowness to break dormancy in the ground. And then if there's any stress, variations in temperature and water, um, the plant senses those stresses and decides to mature earlier. And you find them turning green when they're even shorter. You know, they're like maturing too quickly. So environment being too variable outside is, is an issue. Now, at the bottom there, I say you could grow in high tunnels, which are those, those are plastic houses. If you have a small glass house or screen house, let's put it that way, you could also use that. That's also a nice place to do it outdoors. Next slide. So, so we already said that microgreens are, can be grown throughout the year. Now in winter, in the northern climates, we have shorter day lengths. So you have to take care of that. And I think Rory somewhere mentioned that you need to do up to nine hours of light. And if you don't have access to a south facing window, you need to do the supplementary light. And uh, that has been talked about in a previous slide quite a bit. Remember that some, some, some microgreen varieties will do better than others indoors. Um, do some research. Find out which ones you want to grow, and before you grow it, is it going to do very well indoors? I find like the radish again do okay indoors. So again, my bias is always is really strong on that uh, particular species. Okay, keep keep your keep your lights cheap for those of us who are homeowners. Just buy the fluorescent lights. If you want to invest a little bit more in the LED lights, do so because they last longer. And if you want to be growing for the next so many years, hey, why not? Circulate air well because when air is not circulated well in this very dense, densely planted crops, you might create a microclimate that may encourage disease. Okay, and then water uh, appropriately, as we've, we've said. Next slide. Okay, let's talk a little bit about harvesting and storing. So we've been talking a lot about the seedling and the cotyledons and the leaf stages, the true leaf stages. And, and I wanted to show a picture of that. So in the middle, you see that little seedling there that has two rounded leaves and two leaves with uh, serrated edges. So when we talk about the cotyledon stage, it's those, the cotyledons are the first leaves that come out of the seedling that help start producing or, uh, sugars through photosynthesis. And so it's these cotyledons that get that, give that germinating seed or that germinating embryo, um, the sugars and the nutrients that it's needed because it's really using up all those nutrients in the endosperm that was stored in the seed itself. So when the plants first come out, those cotyledons appear. And then after those cotyledons appear, the first set of true leaves appear. And the, those true leaves are the ones that are, have the serrated edges. So you can really tell a difference between the cotyledons and the first true leaves. So when we talk about when they reach a first stage or true leaf stage, that's the stage I'm, that you're going to be looking for. So when you're harvesting your um, seedlings, your microgreens, 
uh, you want them to reach the first true leaf stage. And depending on the variety that you have, you're going to have anywhere from two to three inches tall. The time between when this occurs can be anywhere from seven days to 21 days. So there's a big difference on that. And again, it's going to depend on the variety that you have. We talked about the harvesting scissors or the knives, making sure that they're, they're sharp. And you can see in the lower right hand corner where, how you're going to go ahead and harvest that. Um, and then store it in the bag. So harvesting is going to be real easy to do. Storing, we talked about already, as far as stored in the refrigerator, in a, uh, or you can put it in a clamshell, like you see on the bottom itself. The, the bottom one are uh, radishes in the um, left-hand side, and the right-hand side are pea microgreens. So there's a big difference. You can use those. Uh, a lot of the commercial growers use those clamshells. So whatever you use is, is going to be based on you. Let's talk a little bit about microgreens and food safety. So when we talk about, when you see the, the news issues with sprouts and people, the sprouts making people sick, as James mentioned earlier, there's a difference between sprouts and microgreens. Okay. So sprouts are soaked in water, they're sprouted in jars or bins without any type of light in high humidity warm conditions. And most of the time they're going to be using recirculated water. And it's this water source or the type of water that if you get a disease in a water source and you reuse that water for another crop, then you can have potential um, cross-contamination between those two crops. <clears throat> but the, generally the sprout seeds have been found to be the main source of foodborne illnesses and outbreaks on those. Uh, those sprouts uh, generally can be harvested with a seed coat. And so when these sprout growers, commercial sprout growers, they have to make sure that they're using a certified seed. And you notice in the diagram that those sprouts are harvested in about five, six, seven days. When we start talking about microgreens, the microgreens, the seeds are placed on the soil, the root system grows into the medium, and the plants are exposed to light and air movement, which helps reduce the incidences of any type of diseases. And it also helps to reduce any type of humidity in there. Uh, the water is generally not recirculated, so you don't have a problem with that. You're not eating the root system or the shoots themselves or the seed coat. Okay, so you're harvesting the plants above by cutting the stems uh, above the root system uh, when the first true leaves appear. So these are going to be generally safer than sprouts. And they're generally about 7 to 14 days, depending on your variety. And we talked a little bit also about water and the water usage. Water is probably one of the, the most important things when you are watering the vegetables in your garden, whether you're watering these microgreens in your house or outside, the water source should be potable. Uh, if you have a, a greenhouse, frost-free water is gonna be a must. Uh, potable water is gonna be important. You do not want to water with groundwater or surface water like ponds or lakes or streams or rivers or anything that's exposed to the surface because you're gonna have instances of microbacterial uh, contaminants such as E. coli that can be in the water. You water on your microgreens or your vegetables, then what's going to happen is that there's a potential of the, that E. coli or whatever's in the water that comes in contact with what you're trying to eat or the harvestable portion of that crop. So when commercial growers, they generally get their water tested and they test it for E. coli because that's what they're looking for. City water, you're not going to have that problem. So municipal water, potable water, that's going to be great. Uh, the only thing to concern about it would be the chlorine. Um, so use any type of potable water if at all possible. If in your growing areas or your growing spaces, uh, most of the commercial growers follow this, but sometimes if you are a homeowner, it's going to be important as well. Make sure the water's not pooling in your growing space because you can still have some contaminants that are in that area and can produce spores or anything else that may contaminate your crop. Hand watering, an uh, overhead water system uh, if possible. I would probably do bottom watering 
Uh, commercial growers, it's a lot harder for them to bottom water, so they do it as a sprinkle system, but as a homeowner, do it from the bottom. Um, and then each variety is going to be different uh, depending on their watering uh, requirements. So do your research on that. The other thing that you're going to have a problem with on your microgreens, when you start seeing conditions like mold or the plants are starting to die or, you know, they get to a stage where they're ready to go and then boom, all of a sudden they just kind of fall over and turn brown. A big part of that is your equipment sanitation. If you have equipment that you've used in the past, like a plastic tray, and you wash it out with water and or you rinse it out with water and then you put a fresh crop or fresh soil in there whatever is attached to that plastic tray has the potential of going back into that soil and contaminate your new crop so equipment sanitation is going to be a very important part you may not see this uh, concern if you are growing two or three crops, but if you're growing crop after crop after crop after crop using the same pan, you're not cleaning it, you're gonna have a problem. So keep them, uh, the harvesting tools, your knives and your, your scissors and your trays, make sure that you have a four-step cleaning process where you're going to pre-rinse or remove the debris from the tray itself, and then you're gonna wash it with soap and, and water, potable water, and soap, use a brush, whatever it's going to require, rinse it out, and then sanit sanitize those trays and tools. You can use a bleach solution of uh, one a tablespoon per gallon of water, or the hydrogen peroxide that you buy at the store is generally a 3%. Uh, it generally should be food grade. Uh, it, the ones that you see at the store generally are. Uh, some of the commercial growers buy a 6% hydrogen peroxide and then water it down or cut it in half to make a 3%. So after you clean and rinse, spray those trays and those uh, utensils with the hydrogen peroxide or the bleach uh, and then do a final rinse and air dry. And that's going to help reduce some of the problems that you're going to have. So some of the good agricultural practices for microgreens is you're going to have good air circulation. We've talked about that because it's going to be important to reduce the incidences of disease. Maintain good worker hygiene. Wash your hands before harvesting. We hear a lot of that today. <laughs> Wash your hands. Good equipment washing and sanitation. Minimize injury to the microgreens when harvesting. So if you use a dull knife, you're going to be smashing those um, stems instead of cutting them cleanly. When you smash them, you're going to have a greater deterioration of the plant tissue and it may not last as long in storage. And again, use the potable water source. Don't use gray water, don't use surface water, or untreated well water. Some of the potential challenges that you're going to have, uh, some of the things that, that people have written in or I have seen, uh, seeds are not germinating, okay? So the problem may be that you have seed viability problems. Maybe the age of the storage conditions or the germination percentage is not correct or it's, you haven't really paid attention to that. Are your trays drying out during the day? Are you keeping them moist? That's going to be important. Uh, loss of crop due to lack of water is a major concern. And soil and seed moist in the beginning stages of germination is going to be important. Maybe the temperature is uh, too hot or too cold, which would result in your seeds not germinating. 55 to 75 degrees is good for germination and it's gonna base on the variety of your seed itself. So we mentioned also about if you do use paper towels and you lift them up and the seeds are still sticking to it, um, then what you need to do is to wait until the seedlings start to push up the towel about an inch and they're showing their cotyledons about two to five days, depending on the variety. So we've talked about that. Uh, thick stand or thin stand, uneven germination. Uh, you should focus on spreading the seed evenly on the medium. The poor quality soil will promote poor germination. So when we talked about the soil and we spent a little bit of time on that, that's gonna be important to make sure you take a look at that and keep that in mind. Seed quality is also going to be a concern. Poor quality uh, may germinate at different time frames. 
Uh, and for a crop that's only growing one to two weeks, this can make a difference. So it's not a problem if you're growing for home use, but if you're trying to do it to sell to retail sales, this can be a big problem. Tall spindly growth, that means that you're going to have a lot of problems with uh, not enough light on it. Healthy growth uh, should be stout and it should be green. Uh, with a good amount of light on that. Uh, seedlings tend to uh, bend or fall over or lighter in color or generally not looking good. Is this a problem with the light source itself? Adding natural light or supplemental fluorescent LED lights would benefit. Be careful if you're moving your microgreens into sunlight from a low light situation because it can burn leaves. So kind of adjust them gradually into a full sunlight if that's what you're trying to do. Um, the microgreens become limp. Uh, don't let them sit in the air after harvest. Uh, some people wash their microgreens. You don't have to. Generally, they're not touching the soil. Uh, you don't really have a problem with that, but if you buy the greens from the store, generally people say to wash them. Use cool water. Uh, put it in a container or bag and keep it, clo uh, keep it in the refrigerator, and they can last about a, a week or so. So if you've ever grown microgreens and you've seen this problem, this is called damping off. And damping off is a seed or seedling disease in which decay occurs before the emergence through the soil surface or after the seeds have emerged or the seedlings have emerged. The seedling stem itself collapses near the soil surface. Uh, it starts at a certain point in the tray and uh, you can see the seedlings are dying. Uh, this is a soil-borne disease. It will spread to other areas of the tray with each watering that you do. So when you look at something like that, this is telling me that you are overwatering your, your soil or your media base. And you're going to see this more in the soil base than you are in the felt pads. Once this starts, it's going to be almost impossible to try and get rid of. Uh, so this is a disease that if you throw the soil away and put fresh soil in without cleaning and sanitizing, this damping off will be seen in future plantings as well. So cleaning and sanitizing is going to be important in this. But this is called damping off and it's caused because you are over watering. Other problems that you're going to see are mold versus root hairs. And so when your seedlings start to grow, if you start to see mold on the soil, that's going to tell you that the water, there's too much water in the soil base itself. Uh, it doesn't have to be soaking wet. When you have a damp soil, if you take a, a handful of soil and you start to squeeze it and you get water dripping out of it, it's too wet. You want to be able to have it maybe form a ball in your fist and when you open it up it maybe crumbles a little bit but it still has some form of a ball that's what you're looking for so any type of mold you're going to see uh, is going to form on the surface of the soil and on the seedlings themselves and it's going to be a fungal hyphae it's going to be like uh, having a spider's web uh, that's occurring on your seedlings when you compare the mold to root hairs, sometimes the root hairs, as you see on the right, are going to look like mold because you have so many seeds together, but that's not going to be the case. So it's going to take maybe a hand lens for you to really take a look and see whether that is mold growing from all over or whether it's just those root hairs that are extending out from the root themselves. So the mold versus root hairs if you really see the mold, it's going to be because of damp, too damp soil, too much of a damp soil. Okay. So let's consider some uh, economics and uh, this is not, we are not very strong on economics, so um, we won't spend too much time on the economic aspects of it. I'm going to open up my video just because I might show some things here. Uh, can you open my video? Um, um, Lori, if you can. Oh, um, you're going to have to do it. Okay. It's not, it's not working. Okay. Hang on. Hang on. Okay. Don't worry about it. If you can 
fine. So um, for a 10, 20 growing tray, remember that tray that we showed earlier on, maybe the cost is a dollar, uh, maybe up to $2. But if you buy in bulk, if you are commercial grower, you may bring down the price because of the wholesale price. And then um, for a homeowner, why is spending the money when we have all these, and I wanted to show you all these things we buy uh, food items in, whether it's that uh, baked bread or cake or Chinese food or um, salads that we buy in containers, keep those containers. Indeed, one of the containers that uh, Rolly showed there has a cover so that when you grow your microgreens there, you can cover it the first few days. It's like a mini greenhouse. It keeps some moisture in, it keeps some warmth in. It helps uh, kickstart the process. The seed costs vary. Again, you note from that uh, chart there that the seeds are a third of the cost of production. They vary. And I was looking online and seeing that if you're going to buy one pound of parsley, you're going to pay $15. If you buy one pound of basil, you're going to pay $45. And if you buy one pound of marigold, you're going to pay $350. So again, how deep is your pocket and what test are you going for? So depending on the seed type and seed supplier, you will have to make your choice. And we still emphasize that you need to buy from reputable suppliers for better quality seeds, so you have better germination, and they'll tell you whether it's treated or not treated. Soil is another uh, big, big uh, input in uh, microgreen production. If you do your own soil, I said earlier on, if you experiment or talk to other people doing it, they'll let you know how they're doing it, you can save big by doing your own soil. If you're a homeowner, just buy some potting mix. All right, the growing pods are expensive, they're unsustainable, and they are less productive. You remember seeing that earlier on. And even the, the soil-less media, coconut core in peat moss are examples, Coconut core is more expensive than peat moss, basically because we can produce our own, well, we can get peat moss locally, whereas we can't get coconut core that easily. We have to get it from where? Florida or somewhere else. Water and energy provide some variable costs. Energy, you know, you're probably spending some money on lights, a pump, maybe a fan, maybe a dehumidifier, all these costs add up. And then finally, there's labor, transport, insurance, and taxes. Next slide. So pricing microgreens, again, maybe this is for the commercial growers. I will want you to read this more for yourself. One more click, yeah. How to sell your microgreens? Are you in the farmer's market? And I, uh, people coming along and saying, I need four ounces, and you have your price at $1.50 or $2, whatever. Or do you have them in clamshells that go for $5 per clam? So that's probably equal to five ounces is equal to $5 an ounce. So it all depends on how you want to sell it. Some people wash them when they package them, others leave them unwashed because customers want to wash them themselves they become messed up a little bit sometimes when you wash them. So depending on how you are selling, you're marketing them, you set the price, find out the prices from other people. I, I walk around Kankakee Farmer's Market and I see somebody selling there. I had some pictures which I can't find, but um, I got the prices. Some of them, it's $3 per ounce because they're just more expensive to produce. So, Keep your prices more or less even in the market. Keep tracks, track of costs of production, all the inputs you are, you're, you're getting into production. And because it's a simple crop to grow, it's easy to follow what, uh, what you're spending, okay? 
And if you're getting expenses of around two to four dollars per tray, it's probably you're within the range of expenses that most other people are going through. The more you can reduce that, the better your profit and the better your profitability, let me put it that way. Next slide. Okay, so this is something I tried on July 27th, which is exactly 10 days ago. I got myself the potting mix. I saved myself uh, the container you see here and all these others. This one on the top there has a cover. That's, that's the one which I said behaves like a little greenhouse, which you see on the right hand side and which I planted with broccoli. Now you notice they are yellow just coming through. That's what they look like when they are coming through. So you just have to wait a little bit. They hit the sun and they become different and you'll see another picture very soon. Next slide. So hit the first one, stop there. So July, July 27th when I planted, I tried on the round tray an experiment and I got myself some garden beans, which are the white ones, and I ran out of the quantity that I wanted. They would have been dense. I would have planted them denser than that if I had more. On the left hand side, I had enough of radish and I planted as densely as I could and that's the most dense I could get to. I, I think I had enough that I was doing an experiment. And down there you see I've indicated that radish, radishes provide, it's a power pack when it comes to nutritional uh, benefits. Down there you see all those. Next, next click once. So in five days, the radishes came through and you can tell they just came through because most of them are yellow and the beans were still down there. And I thought, what a waste of a tray. Then I waited one more day and next, next click, they started coming through, the beans that is. Meanwhile, the radishes were pretty densely populated on their side and coming up pretty good. So next slide. So this is August for one week after, seven days after. And you can see the top left hand corner there is the beans coming through even more. And the radishes have come through and the broccoli have come through in the, what I'm calling a greenhouse like or glass house like uh, container. So they are coming through as well, but they are slower. They are shorter than the radishes. Click once. And then I decided I was going to harvest a few of the radishes just to sample. And the next one slide. The bowl that you see there, I just had some. And I saw one question in the chat box there asking how do you keep them clean? I just couldn't keep them clean enough. I had to wash them. All you see the specks of dirt in there. Um, I just had to clean them up before I consumed them. And so this is one week. I was hoping to show you 10 days thereafter. They're just going strong. Now what you're seeing on the radishes, the leaves are actually cotyledons. Meanwhile, on the beans, what you're seeing is the first pair of true leaves but below the true leaves, you see the cotyledons. Now chewing those cotyledons is not that easy unless you cook the leaf and the cotyledons, but chewing the leaves, that's pretty easy. So from that point of view, I don't think I would want to go with the garden beans that much. I would go more with the radishes as, 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 as I said before. And I don't know if there's one more slide. Well, yeah, I think that's, my presentation there. Resources. Yep, that we've used. Yeah. And some of the questions. Go ahead. I bought a well-reviewed packet of mixed bean seeds and found that they sprouted on such different schedules that they were worthless. Is it better to just sprout one type of bean at a time or is there a trick I'm missing? Answer is for me, is yes. Go with one and if you want another type, go to a different container. And you want a third one, go to a different container. Unless 
you're buying from a very reputable supplier who tells you I've done my research and all these, the, the variation in germination and, and maturation is a day or so. If I'm not being told that, I probably wouldn't try. What do you what do you think, Lori? Yeah, those the packet of mixed bean seeds. The the key word there is mixed, right? So you don't know what kind of beans were in there unless they really list them out. And each variety is going to germinate at different times, just like it would if you were planting in the garden. So these mixed bean seeds, you know, you find that you you find a, a bag or a company that you like and you try it out and sometimes it does work and sometimes it doesn't. Um, most of those microgreen seed mixes that you find at the store are generally uh, combined with different varieties that will germinate at the same time so that's not going to be a problem but sometimes you may find a mix that doesn't. So again yes. this would be hard to determine. Seed sources and that was well addressed by Rory. And then ways to safely avoid the diseases of the microgreens. I think we, you know, the major issue here is water. Water and air circulation. And air circulation and also get some high quality seed. So yeah. the, 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 the supplier has already made sure they're not packaging things that are already contaminated with disease causing organisms. Right. Can you, can you grow microgreens organically? Yep. And we did our best. The answer is yes. And we did our best here to even recommend chemicals that are not, well, chemicals? No. Um, ingredients that are not chemicals. Hydrogen peroxide is something that is safe for us to use. Um, acetic acid is safe for us to use. We actually eat vinegar, which has acetic acid in it. So, yes, you can, first of all, you can get organic seed. It's available. And then secondly, you can start doing it in the kind of media that you want. that has no added fertilizers and stuff like that. So, yes, you can do it organically. No question about it. Okay, the type of equipment you need to start a micro garden uh, affordable places to purchase supplies. If I'm doing it, the only thing I'm going to buy is seed and potting mix. That's the only thing I'm going to buy as a homeowner. Everything else, I mean, I save all these containers and what, I mean, it's just easy to get the supplies. Okay. How many varieties of microgreens are there? We attended to that and they are just all over the place. There are so many of them. Is there special equipment needed to grow microgreens? Special would have to be like the LED lights. Maybe that's where specialty comes in. Otherwise everything else is ordinary. I don't think there's anything that is really out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. Your highest cost is gonna be the soil. Yes. And the soil, yeah. How can they be grown in the winter successfully? As long as you're providing light, warmth, and then your management is up to date, you should be able to eat microgreens every 10 days or every two weeks or every week. You have something coming up that you can sprinkle on your salads. You should have enough. Best soil for microgreens, again, you either do your research and do your own combination or just try everything else. Just remember that if you're using a, a soil-based mix that has peat moss in it, peat moss is going to hold water a lot. And so some soil mixes that you buy at the store, read what's in that mix. If you have sphagnum peat moss or Canadian peat moss or something like that, you know that it's going to hold more water than if you use something like sand or a mix of uh, perlite vermiculite or something that's going to be uh, a little bit different. So any type of potting soil will work that you buy at the store. Uh, just keep in mind uh, the watering aspects of it. Actually, if you reminded me something else, 
ensure that you're not adding more than 0. no, 5% organic matter. If you have too much of organic matter, you might now encourage disease causing organisms to thrive. So keep it between three and 5% uh, or less, that's still fine. And then light sources, we talked about that. You can use the sunlight. That's the number one source that everybody would like to use, it's free. And then other types of lights as well. And then growing microgreens outdoors, I think I discussed that in, in a few slides, in two slides. And I think maybe there's one other, let's go to, Paul, you might wanna see some of the questions. Okay, um, so in the chat box, we have a couple of questions here. It says, um, why don't clay containers have the same problem as wood containers? They, they can. Uh, wood containers tend to hold, or, or the problem with the wood containers is that they may have some grooves or they may have scratches or something where those uh, microorganisms can hold into those grooves and it'd be very hard to get out of. Uh, clay pots also are porous and they do have those uh, concerns as well. So cleaning and sanitizing is going to be a major problem for that um, uh, to make sure that you get them clean and sanitized. So if you're using clay or wood, uh, go ahead and clean and sanitize between the crops themselves. Do you have anything you want to add? And, and, to that? and I, don't, I don't know if you mentioned it, clay is actually soil. Clay pot is clay, it's made from clay soil. Therefore, it takes up a whole lot of water. You have to watch out for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have one from uh, concerned with getting soil mix in the greens when harvesting. Any tips on how to collect them after cutting while keeping them clean? Do you want to address that, James, since you did? Oh, okay. I had said, I had replied there and said, you know, even when I harvested the radishes that I grew, which you see over there, I thought, first of all, they look clean. But once they were in the pot, I mean, in the bowl, yeah, it's like, no, I got a lot of soil with that. I had to wash them. And I don't know how else you can keep them dirt free or soil free when you're harvesting. First of all, the container that I used, by the way, I should say was too deep. So even harvesting was a bit of an issue. I had to go like in there, is, you know, because I didn't want to put too much potting mix to the level of the height of the container because that would be a waste. I only wanted to do one, one and a half inches. So harvesting was a little bit of an issue. And you still pull up some of those seedlings anyway. They bring some soil. With you. you just have to wash them. I don't know what else to say. Yeah, it's going to be hard, especially if you use a soil base or cut them a little bit higher from the soil line instead of right at the soil line. But every time you water, there's a potential of getting soil on top of that, especially yeah, if you have yes. a little bit harder water uh, force that's hitting the soil itself. Uh, I have a, a person that is waiting for a freeze dryer system that they've ordered. Um, and they are want to try and freeze drying uh, to keep the nutrients in them. Uh, do you know anything, James, about freeze drying microgreens? I do not, but we could just use logic here. And since we do do that with herbs, herbs, I don't know if you say herbs or herbs, but we do that. We do uh, freeze dry those. I do not see why we can't do the same with this. Freeze drying simply is simply removal of water in the microgreens or in the tissue that is being freeze dried. So at a, my, my guesstimation is that it would work. Yeah, um, I don't know. I've never tried it. So Robin, if you ever get it and you try it, let us know how it works. Be interested mm -hmm. to find out. We do have another question. Um, does the seed starting mix need to be different than what we use for starting non microgreens? Um, no, uh, the seed starting mix can be any type of a, a potting soil, but there is a product on the market. It's called seedling mix. Um, you buy them at your local retail box store uh, and it will say uh, germination or seedling mix. That would be a good one. It may be a little bit finer type of soil. It may not have enough 
or a lot of peat moss in there because it's that peat moss that's going to cause the damping off or the holding of the moisture. So there are uh, some out there that I have seen and I have used uh, in the past. Uh, so either one of those will work. And you know, I don't know why people don't haven't tried using sand because all you want is support for the plant. It's got its own food. The microgreen has its own food for the first 10 days, 10 to 14 days. It has its own food. Sand isn't very great at holding water and it doesn't have a whole lot of nutrients, that's for sure. But if you're watering it from a secondary container, another tray or something, and water can go up by capillary and they can pull up some water at an inch, I mean an inch of sand that should be able, they should be able to pull water. That might work. The mixes that we use, otherwise we always think long term, this plant will be there for two, three weeks maybe before we transplant it, so we need some food in there. That's part of the reason why there's so much wastage because your microgreens don't really need a whole lot of food from the mix that you're buying. And maybe what I'll do one of these days just to keep things real cheap is to buy potting mix like you saw and an equal amount of sand and just mix those. I have nothing to lose because I don't really need the nutrients from the potting mix. Okay. I have a question concerning the growing pad in the soil and uh, whether you should add any fertilizer when watering or at any stage of the growing system. So um, the fertilizers, or the, let's, let's start with the soil and the pads. So either one or you don't really need to add fertilizer to your microgreens. That's correct. The greens are going to be there for anywhere from two to three weeks maximum. Um, the seedlings, when they start to emerge, they have their own food source when they start coming up and they start developing the, the cotyledons and the first set of true leaves, they're making sugars as well. So generally a fertilizer is not needed. Now, if you're going to go past that 14 day or 21 days, anywhere from 15 to 21 days, you may want to use a quarter strength regular fertilizer, 10, 10, 10, or something like that. But generally you don't need to use any. Um, how long can you store the seeds? Uh, looking to buy bulk seeds and how long to, to store them. So if you have proper storage time, Humidity, um, uh, I'm sorry, the humidity and the temperature uh, are going to be based on how long it's going to be uh, kept. And um, I do have a program tomorrow, a webinar tomorrow on um, seed saving, and I talk about that. But storing seeds themselves, if you buy them in bulk and you keep them in a cool, damp, and uh, cool, dry environment, they should last a good a uh, year or so, depending on the variety. Anything you want yeah, to it's, a, it's another one of those questions where the best answer is two words. It depends on how you're doing it. In, in India, for instance, the Himalayan mountains, there is a seed storage way up there in those mountains, and those seeds store for years. As long as they're not dehydrating or being, you know, well, cold temperature can dehydrate seed, but they have some storage way up there and that seed stores for years and years. In Colorado, there is a seed, what is it called? The cold um, seed uh, storage something. Steve, the, 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 vault, the seed vault. Yeah, the seed vault. But they store seed there and it lasts for many, many years. I have stored seed in a Ziploc bag because I didn't want it to get dehydrated or hit by the cold temperature in a uh, freezer for many, many, many years. Well, five years maximum it was. It was still good. The germination was still good in the 90% and so. So it all depends on how you hold it. In the, free, in the fridge to hold for quite a number of months, may even go for a year in the fridge. So viability is highly dependent on the choice of storage and the type of seed. If you talk about some of these weed seed species in the soil, have we talked about some that last 40 years in the soil? 
They're just waiting for the right conditions. So it all depends on the variety and the holding condition. I believe that was the last question that we had. Um, there were some questions up there like, where do you buy food grade hydrogen peroxide? Because I talked about that. And I quickly Googled and found that if you go to Walmart, or Walmart was there with food grade hydrogen peroxide, all you can go online, like purehealthdiscounts.com. You go there, you can find something, you find what you need. And somebody also asked if we need the video, are we going to share it? And I believe we will. All you have to do is write to us. You have our emails showing here. Is that correct, uh, Lori? Yes. And I will be sending out an evaluation of the program for today, if you would. It'd take less than a minute to finish. Please, 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 we're asking you to do that, yeah. And so we'll send that out today as well. Oh, there's something else, yeah. Would yeah. Va vacuum sealing help for the seeds? You talk about the, that tomorrow, right? Uh, vacuum sealing? Uh, no, I, I do not. I will not be talking about vacuum sealing tomorrow. I don't um, even, okay. Vacuum sealing, you want to be able to keep your seeds in a container that is going to be to maintain the environment for the seed. You don't want it to lose more moisture. You don't want it to gain more moisture. So you're looking at cool and dry. So if you can do a uh, vacuum sealing in a uh, uh, container or, or a plastic bag, that's fine. But generally, we say that you should probably use a glass container for storage uh, rather than any type of a paper bag or something like that. So again, I'm not that familiar with the vacuum sealing, but I will uh, definitely be willing to hear from you if you uh, do it. And finally, I figured how to do the video. I mean, you can see me. And over here, poor, an example of poor germination. Uh, actually, I had this outside. Why, as all of the all of the containers I had were outside, including what you've seen previously. Why, a squirrel decided to come and dig in this one, and I tried to kind of even the soil again later. I don't know whether that's what messed it up. Again, planting too deep can be an issue. Some of these seedlings here are really coming up now, so they must have been real deep, or maybe even the viability of the seed was poor. This is today, and this is uh, the broccoli. I guess they should be ready to eat in another few days because they're still rather small. And this is what I started them off on, this greenhouse effect or glasshouse effect, which I now don't cover because I don't want them to get moldy. I don't want them to be getting too much of moisture. And this is... This is what I'm enjoying. So this is my best. And this is today. You can see how big the, the beans are. And like I said, nobody wants to eat the cotyledons here because they are really tough to eat. Unless now I stir fry, cook this, stir fry this. Meanwhile, these uh, radishes are showing the coleoptile. This is this is the first pair of, seed, of, of leaves. And that's what they are showing and they are ready to eat because they are approximately two inches long. I don't know if that is showing that well. Yes. Ready to eat. And once you cut, they're not going to regrow. That's one. And then if I was, because I live alone, if I had this tray and I was doing radishes, I would do an eighth of it today, another eighth tomorrow, another eighth the other day, and so forth, so that by the time I come back to the first, maybe I'll be, maybe when I harvest the first portion, you know, uh, if I want to experiment, replant there and see how it's going to grow, whether there's any disease that will come up and stuff like that. Those are all things I would try now. And I wanted to share that with you. Okay. I think that's it. No more questions. So thank you very much for joining us today. We uh, appreciate uh, any comments that you have. Again, I'll be sending out the evaluation. Uh, please fill it out. And thank you for joining us. I hope it was helpful for you. Have a good day, everyone.
Bye, everyone.